All right, let's get uh, let's get started. Thank you all for coming. Hello, and welcome to the second convening of the New Third World. Um, I'm Malva Kajali. If you didn't know me, now you do. And today I have the pleasure of welcoming the wonderful Sara El Kamal, Hazem Fami, Abigail Mangesha, Adiba Shahid Talukder, Haloon Zhu, and Eleanor Weil, who will be reading to dazzle and delight us. Uh, by logging onto this Zoom meeting, you've consented to joining our local chapter in your home community. If there isn't one, congratulations, you've just founded it from the comfort of your own home, and I hope we'll be very, very happy together. So a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Uh, this event is funded almost entirely through the generous support of poets and writers through public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs and the City Council. Uh, I also wanted to give a quick shout out to Topaz Winters and Gaia Rajan, the magical duo of Half Mystic Press, who have so beautifully hyped and helped me circulate and promote this event. And uh, an extra special thanks to my original co-conspirator and co-captain, uh, the wonderful Itiola Jones, who is not only the truly the platonic ideal of a friend, but has graciously agreed to be my backup MC today in case the power cuts out. Give it up for Itiola. Uh, lastly, I want to thank all of you for your participation, for showing up, for filling the room. Uh, I'm so excited for us to be convening together here from across the globe via the powers of the World Wide Web. Uh, it's super cute having all these sweeties in the room. Uh, and lastly, I wanted to say we collected a small but significant donation pool uh, from the event, right? So thanks to you all. We'll be paying that forward to the organization Razum for Ukraine, where they'll be used to purchase and distribute supplies uh, focusing on the hardest hit city centers in Ukraine. So thank you so much. I'll drop a link on that shortly, uh, but we'll get right into it. Uh, this is a reading series. It's a new reading series inspired by the non-aligned movement and their dream for the third world. Uh, that dream is a future shaped by anti-colonial networks of friendship and solidarity across distance. And if we were in convening in person at this moment, uh, this is where I'd open into like a little history presentation burlesque. Uh, but for the sake of Zoom and its uh, finite limitations, I'll keep it to this, that the non-aligned movement was a gathering and an alliance of world leaders and nations that came together in the wake of rapid decolonization, liberation struggles, political revolution all across the world, fights for self-rule, uh, which they won. And having won, they looked to their left and they looked to their right. They looked uh, to the major world powers of the moment, the United States, with the system of Western, Western liberal democracy and the capitalist world order. And they looked to the USSR with state communism. And they decided they wanted to side with neither. Instead, they sided with one another. And in the mathematics that still underpins our coalition building from the margins to this day, they found that they were in fact the majority of the world. So this is a really transformational time for imagining the history and the future of the world and imagining it differently. Uh, a fundamentally ethical act which carries enormous transformational potential. Uh, so each convening of this reading series will be like a little bit different, but our aim is to bring together poets and performers whose work emerges from this very collision of global and personal histories. Uh, and again and again, we'll return to this historical moment of the non-aligned leaders and their third world movement as a rupture point, a portal, an open door, uh, when anti-colonial and liberation strategies for people of color across the globe crossed, collided, and formed a net. We'll do this to remind ourselves that we are still being held in that net, to remember what is too easily forgotten, but which cannot be lost, uh, that these legacies of global solidarity are actually our inheritance, and that in spite of what the gross uh, kind of subtext of US like identity politics um, and cultural politics like would imply to us, our communities are not as alone, disconnected or superficially united as we may feel. Uh, and how could we be when we are each other's past, present and future? Uh, so in this lineup this afternoon, uh, depending on where you are, uh, in this lineup, we have a man straight out of a Beckett play waiting for Frank Ocean. We have a mermaid backstage at the, at the Cairo Opera House. We have the beloved of the Guzzle world on the Brooklyn Bridge, wandering New York. We have a poet amongst us who asks, is it better to be a monster or a shadow? And we have a musician who is the light of the world. Uh, so I'm so, so excited to be here with you in the Zoom and to be welcoming our wonderful readers and performers. Uh, and I'm gonna pass the mic right over to the amazing Eleanor Vile. Um, who's going to open it up for us with like a little performance. 
um, and then we'll get into the readings. Uh, but everyone give it up for Eleanor. And Eleanor, I'll ask you to turn on your audio. Thank you. Thank you so much, Veronica. give it up for Eleanor. Truly, truly the incandescent preacher of uh, our lives. Um, and you can find a link to her website in the chat. Um, and what a beautiful way to open us up. Uh, I'm so excited next to introduce the beautiful um, poet, translator, and singer of Urdu and Persian poetry, Adiba Shahid Talakter. Um, oh, hey, Islam Zina is here. Um, what can a person say about Adiba? Uh, there's a few things, right? The first is that her beautiful book, Shere Janan, uh, The City of the Beloved, came out with Tefello in 2020. She has a gorgeous little chapbook that came out with Glass Poetry Press uh, two years before. She's the winner of the Kundaman Poetry Prize, but none of these things really get to the heart of the person who Adiba is. Um, which is just like incandescently beautiful. Um, I met Adipa a few years ago. Uh, I um, found her book and found her poetry and had this like compulsion that I just had to meet her. And so I created a premise to meet her. Um, and I decided to interview her for the margins and uh, then miraculously got to spend like three hours with her on the phone um, as she talked through um, 
her worldview and like the beautiful way that she inhabits New York City and the beautiful way that she inhabits like the world of experience and emotion. Uh, Adiba does a thing that's very rare in the world. She takes kind of the, the poetic lexicon of the guzzle world and applies it onto um, her material world all around her. And we're so, so, so lucky to have her. Um, she's a deep and sensitive soul. So without further ado, give it up for Adiba. Adiba, take it away. Thank you so much, Malvika, for that beautiful um, introduction that I did not deserve. Uh, um, and also Eleanor and the rest of um, the readers uh, for reading with me. And uh, yeah, so um, <laughs> I'll start with my uh, first poem from um, Shahir Jana, The City of the Beloved. Uh, and the rest of it will be new work. Katak, the dance of the courtesans. One, in the mirror, tilt your chin higher. At the end of each chakra, return to your own eyes. Your breath, a spool of thread, thin, sharp, unravels. Pull, pull it back in. Shackle yourself until your ankles are gold. Hold your wrists delicate beneath your jewels. Now dance, the city awaits you. Two, goddess, beloved, flame, they say, all beauty converges in you. Men gather at saints' tombs, but rush to your doorstep with greater madness. Let them gaze at you until you begin to tremble. Allow yourself to be slighted. You, fragile as glass, will learn. You were made to break. Three, in the final scene of the 1972 Hindi film Pakiza, Meena Kumari's love is getting married to someone else and she is performing at the wedding. She shatters a lamp, then dances upon its shards, leading crims leaving crimson footprints all over the white sheets. Um... The next, uh, the next few poems are uh, more recent ones. Uh, there's one I wrote for Palestine, titled Of Sun and Fire. Of Sun and Fire. The mirror of water reflects and shapes the human form, faithless, dissolving with every whim and stone. Descent from holy dome of light to nether world, dark pomegranate red, bloodthirsty, thirst deep river, wild, drained of light, mind and body doused. We gather our golden selves and fire. Crow's shadows slip off marble onto warm dirt, splitting self from self from self. Hollow-eyed girl of burning streets, girl of rubble. Light will adorn us, bury our sins in the sea's night. Come, the air here is a balm for the weary soul. The beaches, the skyscrapers, the blue, blue water. For in the white marble dome of the heavens, God exists in our own image. Um, a lot of my uh, poems have to do with bipolar disorder uh, because it's a diagnosis I have and it has uh, been a large part of um, how I view the world, either the episodes themselves or their aftermath. Uh, so this uh, poem is titled Episode. You receding water, human consciousness, sands ever dissolving. No sign of our union persists, that flash of sacred light, lucid mind, desires irrelevance, the waters of memory cloud and darken, and what was no longer with certainty is. Our faces once burned in biting winters, we marched knowing this moment, know this one, to signal revolution, in each flicker its own ghastly end, and how the sun must dissolve each night into the horizon itself, that furthest reach of 
that furthest reach of sight, herald of possibility. So burn down the fields, let aglow heaven's fire, salt again the wounds of self, create once again the self. Um, the next few uh, are a series of poems around um, the legend of Soni Mahival. It's um, it's a Punjabi legend. Um, basically, there's this uh, woman, Soni, who is married. Um, she's actually a potter's daughter. Uh, she gets married to someone um, she doesn't love and then swims across the Chenab River each night to um, meet the person that she loves named Mahival. Um, and then she actually uses, she can't swim, so she uses the support of an earthenware pot. And I was actually talking to Malvika about this during our conversation. Um, but yeah, there's, uh, the story goes that, you know, she, she takes this earthenware pot every night and one night her sister-in-law finds out that, you know, she's been doing this. So she replaces uh, the baked earthenware pot with um, an unbaked one. And so she takes the uh, pot across the river um, and she actually drowns because the pot melts. So, um, and then my most recent manuscript has to do with like the idea of water and clay in general. So. Um, this is a series of poems I wrote around it. Sony to her earthen pot. As it dusks, the Chenab's waters turn, and I must swim to my lover's hut. O oh, clay pot, hold me, take me across this deep, raging God's wrath. The night is cold, rising, a dome, and then a world. Hold me, the water surges like a flame. When I leapt, my mind woke to my eyes to my eyes madness, my color scattering into dark and marveled. You so close to dissolution, a silver hair sustaining a dream of heaven. Stay whole. How these cruel waves lashed my lover's bare back. Sony, he cries, gasping for air. Sony, his voice breaks, descends, dissolves. So this is Mahival, the uh, person that Sony loves, and he was a buffalo herder. So it's titled Mahival, the buffalo herder. Mahival, the buffalo herder, whose flute dusks the river pure as the sun, and the moon silvers the night of sky and water, and Sony swims in its quiet glow, holding her breath, her life earthen carved with leaves and at the bank as he lifts her wet translucent and lays her upon the dewy grass they implore the sun that sun of vengeance and god to dissolve its truth in the river's crimson fury um and before uh this final poem um i want to thank malvika once again um and my co-performers. Um, and I also uh, want to say that this, uh, I sometimes write poems after ghazals that I really like, and a lot of times these ghazals are sung. Um, and this particular one is um, by Fez. It's uh, titled Tufan Badil Hai Har Koi Dildar Dekhna. Um, and um, yeah, so I just like to uh, sing two lines of that before I read the poem based on it. So here goes. Um, this is more of a new thing. I'm not used to performing um, because of COVID. Sa ri pa. Tufan, 
Faithlessness were fate. How each lover carries a storm in his heart. Oh, your glowing face, my love, my love, preserve your flame. As we broke our fast, the East River blue turned deeper. I slipped on the rocks, my coal spread, water ran over my dress. Oh, Manhattan, your light was spilling, the drunken waves, the way we deceived ourselves, that in the water, those golden, gleaming, ethereal ones, distance dissolving to nothing, everything, were real, or could last long enough to slake our thirst. That spring, he traveled to my city, searching each face for mine. He spoke in poetry. The water was rushing. I was trembling cold, answering like lightning, verses that left tears in his flesh. He searched and searched. The water had cleared. No poems held his name. Thank you so much. I'm going to give it up for the most brilliant girl in the world, Adiba Shahid Kalifir. Um, no poems held his name. My goodness. Uh, so blessed to have you. Um, and next up, we have uh, the wonderful Haloon Zhu. Um, I first met Haloon at the first New Third World uh, event, the inaugural event back in November. He came out to support um, some friends. And uh, he was just like so shiningly generous and sweet um, and just like such a light and wonderful spirit. And it was only weeks and weeks later as I was uh, editing the footage, I realized that as the poet Sara Ghazal Ali was performing directly before each poem, and she would say in that gap of space after she would say the title of her next uh, poem that she would read and before she would like take the breath in to actually read the poem, Halloween was there. Um, making like these like like barking and panting sounds of like deep and affectionate animalistic support and i was i literally was editing these videos um days and days and days of editing these videos and wondering like who is it like i was putting it together who is the animal in the room like who is the person who loves so deeply um who is like this repeat motif um throughout the whole event and then i brought it up finally to her i was like this is a mystery uh, what, what's up? And she was like, oh yeah, it's Helen. Um, so give it up for, uh, amazing poet and filmmaker in his own right. Um, Chinese American poet, writer, and filmmaker. Um, his debut chap just came out in December, Ultimate Sun Cell. Go get your copy. We'll drop a link. It's been published by New Delta Review. Um, it placed runner up in their 2021 chap book contest. It is a gorgeous and graphic, cover that feels like bubblegum pop. Um, and it was selected by the wonderful Brandon Shimoda. Uh, their writing has appeared absolutely, his writing has appeared absolutely everywhere wonder, wonderful in Narrative Magazine, Gulf Coast and everywhere else, but you don't need to know that. Uh, you only need to know that they're one of those wonderful Renaissance people who like dabbles in different mediums like all the time. Um, and I had the absolute pleasure of watching their uh, short film, Winter Prayer, which like just came out, was just finished and which won honorable mention uh, in the Berlin Indie Film Festival. It's like everything good that we like 
uh, and it's up on YouTube now and you should go watch it. It's about like Chinese takeout and intimacy between bodies and intimacy of like the soul and this thing that happens where you meet like uh, religious leaders and then suddenly your whole heart cracks open and pours out on the table. Um, and it's uh, it's a short, so it's really engaging. I'll drop a link, uh, but give it up for the very, very multi-talented Halun Zhu. And Halun, take it away. Hello. Hello, everyone. Oh my God, I'm sweating Hi. so much. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'd like to say thank you, Malvika. Thank you, Third World Reading Series. And also thank you so much, Diva, for going before me. Um, Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful performances. And thank you to the music. The music was absolutely fantastic. Um, uh, I would like to say I am a yeller um, in general in crowds. I'm like the type to like go full like, yeah, but I'm gonna, I'm like refraining from doing that right now. Um, but yeah, uh, I have uh, probably two, three poems and I'm gonna try to figure out time right now. Nine minutes. And then, um, but yeah. Uh, can everyone hear me? Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. All right. Terrifying. We can hear you. <laughs> oh, okay. Wouldn't it be funny if I was like muttering under my breath. I'm like, come on, Haloon, you could do it. Well, yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> no, you have a very uh, deep and like, like radio voice. So take it away. No radio voice. No. But yeah. Hey. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, I have two new poems that I wrote in the last two, three months. Um, and I've been workshopping. I haven't really been sending out. I've just been kind of like aggressively editing. Um, but I'll start with one that I'm particularly fond of and we will go from there. It is called um, The Instinct. The ordinance had gifted us with reeves. Magic will protect you, the voices said. And we would forget godliness. The amnesia would be protection. Amnesia as the self moving forward. But this was not beyond. Our task was to repudiate the claims made from the higher desks and see what the world had been up to. On our way down, a comet passed by us, warning us of the tax. To be alive a second time means always a duty of finishing. But we were not prepared. One messenger could not claim himself to the house and chose instead to kneel by the fire, feeling safe by the primary creation. Our group left him there as he melted. We did not remember our wings, nor would it have been any good, if had ever been any good. I forgot my task, entranced by the country, where the lights competed with the water, and yes, I wanted to stay here. So I rested my head upon a bench and slept for a while. In the hospital, they checked my body, touching my temple for injuries. Lady, later in the courtyard, Another patient said, how it looks like heaven here. So the west side, twin cherry blossoms grew in the small space, enraptured with one another. Oh, I learn how the gr earth grows in twos. On the day of my departure, there was no light to bring me back home. Instead, I was simply moved to the next location, a house with steel bars covering the windows. The bars were shaped like a diamond pattern and protected us. In the cover of sleep, my dream brought me back to the city in which I first arrived. There, by the sidewalk, a small and green animal slept on a bench. The dream did not recognize me as its owner, but I knew where I must have gone. I knelt with it and held its hand. In the dream, it flew away, disappearing before a cloud. When I awoke, I did not think of myself as a stranded person. It was not a cruel fate to be in a place filled with sound, even while hungry and loyal. Yeah, thank you. That's my first poem. Um, yes, how am I doing on time? I got, okay, all right. Um, I've been very like, I don't know, but like very, very obsessed with time in the form of like 10 minutes segments. Um, I, I, I think I'll read a quick poem from my chapbook because I feel like, well, because the chapbook is new and it's out. Um, this one's called Darkened Sea of Land and it's not published anywhere. It was one of those things that went direct to like DVD to the, the chapbook. So yeah. Darkened Sea of Land. One. 
Darkened and dangerous sea of land, I kneel to you. Sometimes when the elders aren't looking, we even pray in the ginger woods where the earth keeps tally of the shadows and all. I break federal quarantine to go to Pennsylvania. I don't stop until I hit five hours west to which I can tell my entire body is panicking. Two, we rest on a mount of starving crabs and call it sand. The sea, the sea, this is one illusion. Three, during the day, large arms made of bedrock burst from earth. They are 60 feet tall and emerge to greet visitors and doles returning home. Golem, Aphrod, the arms reach and reach, hugging close and tired mountains and towns before falling asleep again. Four, when I say Pennsylvania, I really mean California. Now, when I say that, I really mean London. The measure of one step to another, the transferring of statements into worlds. This is an advent horizon of a sentence. Five, there are holes on the side of the hills. There I find the skeletons of unmoved and dead presidents. They lay on their sides, holding something precious, something I cannot truly know. When I return home, I too lay on my side, my knee on top of the other, the joints collecting in form. This is illusion. Those moments of pain, like a riverbank, like roads where all bones meet alike. Alan, do you have some some small papers or something that are uh, touching your laptop, like near yeah. the microphone? I I am. Um, did you guys catch the last poem or? Oh no. Yeah, yeah, we did. It was no, it was perfect. Thank you. It was right. perfect, and now we can hear you again. Okay, great. Okay, nice. Um, this is my last poem. It is called Small Village. Um, okay. Small Village, one. Luminous rainbow. Family of 40, show me sincerity of a town burning towards twilight. And in the family, all but one falls ill. Mark of a miracle or an error. A circle is not a town, and yet from the people's hearts, a sphere forms among the dirt. Two, a pet tiger is running with his little heart. The child traveling parallel to the winter pathway goes back to where the villagers are laughing. It does not matter who they laugh at, and this is one definition of home. Departed, where is your past? Have you hidden it yet? in the proper place within the town's well or gone off to the hills near the city to release upwards to the sky. Three, a decade passes. The library at the center of the town grows to fit new children now. And will they forgive me for my return or do they blame the ones who never left? I am an expert at apologizing more than I need to. Maybe it's to prepare everyone for that one day when I find out what I'm apologizing most for. And on that day, I'll never say sorry again. Yes, that is, that is, um, those are my poems. <laughs> um, yes, I can introduce the next speaker now. If you don't. Writer and editor from Addis Baba, Abigail Mengesha is a recipient of the George Harmon Cox Award for Poetry, and currently a Jan Gabriel Fellow at New York University, where she is an MFA candidate in poetry and teaches a first year writing course. Previously an editor for the Washington Square Review and Adis Photo Fest, her writing has appeared in Kish Magazine and her performances featured at Cornell University and elsewhere. Give it up for Abigail. Yeah, we are. <laughs> thank you everyone. Thank you so much for that introduction. And um, it's an honor to be um, like reading here with other amazing poets and performance. Um, and thank you Malvika for organizing this event. Um, the first poem I'm going to be reading was written um, in 2020 where I was having 
um, difficulty writing anything. Um, and I told myself just to just write and this poem came to fruition. Um, it's pretty short, but it has um, a great value for me. So I'll go read that. Tug of war. Beetles stir the thin air as I consider yielding to the racket. High frequency blues, rattles from the chest, wails of an ambulance two streets over, a buzz in one corner, a citron shrub in the other. And this is what my life has simmered to. Doubts join the call of toads, my frayed ego confettied upon the grass. Over two decades, and I've not settled into my limbs. Each brassy hour escorts another dormant ache, my fingers reaching inside for a bundle of silence. Still, daisies sigh in the open, unbothered by the tug of war. From solitude shade, I meet the rubying sky and wonder if I'm still desperate for future, no matter how loud. Um, yeah, that was the first poem. Um, the second poem is titled after um, a musical genre from Ethiopia known as Tizita. Um, and the closest translation to Tizita would be a deep melancholic feeling. Um, and um, it's titled, and I think the closest musical genre would be the blues. Um, so yeah, I, and this poem is also, I think the only poem I've written um, about like a romantic relationship. So yeah, um, Tizita. A right place for torture, past the skull, deep within remembrance, where you plant mines between my ribs, blast my flimsy jail, Feel your way through the splinters, my heart a scrap of prickly pear bursting against your teeth. Here you are, a baritone of want. I still feel your palms sweeten above my knees, then a touch of yearning to finger the night's plumes and somehow offset our distance. In such moments, nostalgia grows inadequate. Too narrow to arrest the wreckage of me clinging to your shade, these ruptures of peppergrass and lace. Um, yeah, and the next two poems were inspired by Medusa's myth. And I came, I decided to write more about Medusa when I was doing research um, on Ethiopian figures in Greek mythology and how they were. Um, like whitewashed and basically don't have any form of representation in the current understanding of like what Greek mythology is, um, ranging from Andromeda to Cassiopeia, like Cepheus and a bunch of other figures. And I read a blog post that basically um, linked Medusa to this warrior queen from um, East Africa, specifically Sudan and Ethiopia. And that and this like blog post basically hypothesizes that the myth originated because um, Alexander the Great thought this warrior queen had snakes for hairs because of her locks, her long thick locks. So I was interested in like situating Medusa in a contemporary Ethiopian setting and how it will look if she was like in a domestic setting and all of that. Um, so this next poem is titled, What Grows Here? An acacia bush, my curls ripen into kinks by red brick villas beneath a ceiling of jacarandas. Sunbirds tussle for nectar while I sprout appetites, chase guava juice and ink pots, hoard cowrie shells and wet stained linens, even things I never meant to keep. This barbarian tongue these thick slices of abstinency. At noon, I root my own shadow among mango trees and make a stew from mud and petals. 
eyes half open, gums mossy from chewing too much sugar cane in the front yard. I take before as today and today as after. No slithery grudge, no word for these scales on my scalp. Oblivious to the power of a glance. I'm a bounty of venom and omen, a girl with slick plates playing senyo maxenyo at dusk. My parents on the veranda, Medusa, come back inside. Um, and the last poem is titled Obad with Medusa. Wednesday, I work a comb through the tangles of dawn, persistent like turmeric stained nails. Twice cursed, I wake claw side up and leave my civil ways in bed. A fine species with scales for wings, no longer thin from feeding only on resentment. I've grown into my eyes low brown. My anxiety beetling in the spare rooms of my skull. Whole season spent making sense of preferences. Cardamom over cloves, incense over candles. What is tender over what thunders past the body like water does a faucet. I've yet to walk acceptances outline, tending my children of stones. And this shame, how many ways to pronounce it. Poor priestess, bitter jam of plum peels, horror myth. I've yet to outgrow it like last month's old skin. No matter, I still slide into the throat of today, my morning tea, the prayers of my mother's mother's mother. Um, yeah, those are the poems I have for you guys. Um, so I'll go on ahead and introduce the next reader. Um, so I have the immense honor of introducing the amazing Egyptian poet, Sara el Kamel, who I'm fortunate enough to have gotten to know and befriend during our time together at NYU's MFA program. I'm always in awe of Sara's brilliant mind and her generosity and devotion towards people, language, and art. Her poems are vulnerable, profound, curious, and immediate while generating a deep resonance through the exploration of the self, history, and myth. Both a poet and journalist, Sara's work has appeared in The Common, Michigan Quarterly, The Yale Review, Four-Way Review, The Rumpus, and many more. In addition to being named a 2020 Gregory Janikian Scholar by the Adroit Journal and a finalist in Narrative Magazine's 30 Below Contest, her poems have also been anthologized in Best New Poets 2020, Best of the Net 2020, The Break, Break, Break Beats Poets Volume 3, Halal If You Hear Me, and 2035 Africa Volume 2. Her incredible debut chapbook, Field of No Justice, was published by the African Poetry Book Fund and Akashic Books in September 2021. So without further ado, I invite Sara to the virtual stage. Thank you so much, uh, Abby, for that uh, gorgeous intro. I'm shaking. Um, I'm shaking after your poems, which were incredibly gorgeous. Uh, I love you. <laughs> uh, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, thank you, Malvika, for putting us together, for bringing us together today. Um, I feel so much love and uh, gratitude and stuff. Um, so much stuff. I'm so happy to be reading with all the new friends and I wish I could stop shaking. Um, but, uh, I'll try to do that by reading, which, uh, sounds very counterintuitive. Um, okay. This year is the anniversary of my parents' divorce, the 20th anniversary of my parents' divorce. <laughs> Uh, that's how I'm going to introduce this reading and also introduce uh, a year of bad writing. <laughs> uh, I really want to indulge in the pain. I just, I, I don't know. I can't help it, actually. Um, so anyway, the first poem I'm going to read is so uh, new that there isn't even a title yet. So I'm open to title suggestions. Um, 
but it is after a poem by Terence Hayes called uh, Things Seen Right and Left Without hmm, Things Seen Right and Left Without Glasses. <clears throat> Sometimes I feel like a crow or a widow on the floor beside the body or below a tree that's been chopped down to revive the view. My own body turned granite, turned black river, morning curdling the skin like wind were fact. Sometimes I feel like the mother of five stillborns who still live inside me. Sometimes I feel like a February heat wave, a silver shadow around a girl's lips, the wind by the sea making impossible the salt. I am a bad house. That's why they cannot leave. Sometimes I feel like a martyr who lost his life trying to free a litter of kittens born to an activist in prison. The kittens feed on the marrow of night. The activist hides them in her hair between her teeth. And the only dream I'm not looking for someone I can't find, I'm looking for me. I have two tongues turning amber like leaves. The dead sleep through everything, even seasons. Sometimes I feel like a prisoner playing his five string cello before breakfast, but I don't have a cello. I have made so many things impossible. In my dream, I know the name of the place I live, but not how to find it. I move through cities as frantic as dust, looking for a spring as deep as a good mother's uterus. The wind goes quiet when I find it. The wind goes quiet when I find it. Okay. Um, cool. Uh, this is Pentimento. After they split, my father used scissors to cut my mother from our childhood photos, blacked out her name in the lower corners of, of large paintings of wild horses, of men huddled together in a desert wedding against a burnt sienna sky, of little scarlet gondolas in Venice, the canal always the same cerulean. I would watch her for hours, stretching bare canvas over the edges of wooden frames, fixing it with shiny nails, coating it with gesso. Probably embarrassed by what he did to our photos, my father kept the albums locked away for so long, I was afraid he lost them. Instead, he blew up pictures of Dina and me as toddlers to replace what I couldn't remember used to fill the rooms. Almost every time he looked at the one of just me in a thin orange dress, he said, your mother had no patience for your hair. No longer home to to detangle our curls at the beginning of each school year, my mother would take us to the cheap salon across the bridge to chemically straighten our hair. It was always morning when we walked in, almost always night when we left. The chemicals that relax the hair follicle also burn patches of our scalp. And I don't know about Dina's fingers, but mine couldn't stop, can't stop, excavating the scabs, peeling the bloodied crusts like paint off humid walls. The corner room with the balcony turned desert. Dust clung to its powder blue walls like fire ants to sugar. Crows annexed the clothesline. I, I turned all our clothes brown, left them a sleeping hound on the bathroom floor. There is so much we never learned, so many years without pictures. On school days, our father woke up before six to boil eggs, used the fork to mash them with potatoes for breakfast. On Fridays, Dina and I prayed behind him. We hugged and kissed on the olive rug before standing back up, feeling so holy. He used the night to clear our house of her things, to crescent the photos, closet the albums. It must have been brave to launder a whole life like that, your two girls asleep in their rooms. I still sniffed out glass bottles of oil and turpentine, whispered to the horses and God before bed, my scalp flaking off into my dreams, where they are, even now, still married. When I started praying alone, I, I left my door cracked. I guess I wanted him to see he was doing something right. Whatever he used to coat the bottom strips of her paintings has lately started to chip, now a patch as if of parched soil extends across each of my mother's compositions, the shapes of her name, again, almost visible. 
the white horse's hoofs very nearly freed. Oof. Okay, um, cool. Uh, <laughs> this is just poetry uh, or not, I don't know. I'm not gonna cry. Um, All right, what should I read? Uh, okay, just because Mavaka called it out at the beginning, I'm gonna read uh, the mermaid poem. <laughs> um, okay, this is backstage at the Cairo Opera House. I was one of 10 mermaids. They dressed me in a two-piece turquoise costume, my chest visible behind the beads, the early swelling around the nipples. Like an expert actress, I started to cry. Ruined rehearsal. Sniffling, I gave the teacher my mother's number. Your daughter is hysterical. She is refusing to wear the mermaid costume. There was no way I was going on stage like that. My father would be watching. I didn't want him thinking he taught me nothing about the meaning of skin. My whole life, I'd watched him lean on anger like a friend. I couldn't risk it. My mother came quickly, her lips smeared an oily orange, her black fringe perfect, obscuring the early lines. It must have been late spring. She handed me an oversized pink turtleneck, ugly as a blobfish. I let her print her, oil, her orange lips on my skin. Thank you, mommy, thank you, I said, though I wanted to run off and drown. My good skin. Did you tell Baba I cried? For years, I hung the concert poster in my room opposite the bed. In the sea of small bodies, I could sometimes see a girl who looked like me. Both of us swam in our good skin like swindlers. Okay. Um, complete indulgence happening now. This is my last poem uh, titled Because of My Mother. <laughs> This is the mature thing to do, just blame uh, our parents. Um, okay, thank you for listening, everyone. Um, because of my mother. I know cravings because of my mother. I was born with pale green grapes on my pelvis because of my mother. I know nipples because of my mother. I know the ginger stain of henna because of my mother. I know rice pudding and cotton balls because of my mother. Six spoons of sugar because of my mother. I'm always six because of my mother. As a girl in the Mediterranean, I almost drowned because of my mother. I could never swim before because of my mother. I found the chest of my father because of my mother. When I'm really scared, I laugh because of my mother. When a man is really angry, I laugh because of my mother. I feed on the soft skin inside my lips because of my mother. Every time I touch my clitoris, I smell it stink because of my mother. The wrong fruit because of my mother. I am afraid of my fingers because of my mother. Of myself in the dark because of my mother. I'm a child in a mermaid costume idling on the shore because of my mother. I am a stray cat in a room with no milk because of my mother. The sounds I make embarrass me because of my mother. I, I did not shave until I was 26 because of my mother. I know how hair yields to sugar because of my mother. How hairless my mother. I think I should sleep very still because of my mother. I found mothers in dreams in the Dead Sea one spring because of my mother. I lick open the mouths of caves because of my mother. I was born yellow like a migrant dog in a mountain cave because of my mother. I speak to the wind because of my mother. I am a daughter left in the care of crows because of my mother. Everywhere I go, I make a temporary monster because of my mother. I swift through the rice grain by grain looking for stones because of my mother. I feed everyone else before before myself because of my mother. I could never get the meat cubes to soften because of my mother. I carry small stones in my chest because of my mother. I found mothers in classrooms waiting in line outside the Apple store on Prince Street because of my mother. In Cairo after New York, I had a house to stay in because of my mother. The curtains a sickening yellow because of my mother. I moved so slow that year because of my mother. The nutritionist said I was addicted to sugar because of my mother. I cut out sugar because of my mother. I was convinced the bed was infested with bugs because of my mother. My back bled for days because of my mother. I burned the mattress 
because of my mother. The lights here are dimmed because of my mother. I'm dreaming, I'm dreaming of two identical mothers and I do not scream because of my mother. Both of them chew their bright orange lips in the same mirror. I don't know which of them is mine because of my mother. For years, I collected negatives of wombs because of my mother. My own womb is crawling out of itself and where is my mother? I don't know where the pain is because of my mother. I dissolve sugar in cold water because of my mother. I am bad with water because of my mother, bad with fire because of my mother. I sweeten even the softest grapes because of my mother, put my ears to my pelvis because of my mother. I think if I sleep very still, I will become my mother. In the dark, I think I peel the, in the dark, I think I can peel the ears off my face and give them to my mother. Instead, I'm swimming right into my mother. Thank you so much uh, for listening to that. Uh, I'm so grateful to everyone here. Uh, breathe with me. Did it work? Did you read your way through shaking? Sorry? Did it work? Did you read your way through shaking? Yes, yes. <laughs> Are you shaking? Yes. <laughs> uh, no, I want no shaking. Um, Okay, maybe maybe Hazem is shaking now. It's kind of your turn to shake, Hazem. Um, who I'm about to introduce, Hazem Fahmi, uh, a fellow Egyptian writer, um, is a writer and critic from Cairo. Um, his second chapbook, Waiting for Frank Ocean in Cairo, is forthcoming from Half Mystic Press in 2022. This this year. Um, I've had the privilege of reading it and it's so gorgeous. Uh, I, I want to dance to it the way I want to dance to Frank Ocean's music. Um, it is a whole house of, of memory um, and um, a speaker that is so close to my heart, um, so real, so honest. I can't wait for everyone to read this chat book. Um, Hazem Fahmi is also um, a critic, like I said. He runs the interview series Wust al Balad on Substack. Uh, his first chat book, uh, Red Jild Prayer, won the 2017 Diode Editions Contest. Um, a Kundiman and Watering Hole Fellow, his poetry has appeared or is forthcoming in the Best American Poetry. 2020 Asian American Writers Workshop, the Boston Review and Prairie Spooner. Um, his criticism has appeared or is forthcoming in the LA Review of Books, Moby Notebook, Reverse Shout and Mizna. Um, I can't wait for you all to hear Hazem. Um, please join me in welcoming him to the stage. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, there was a uh, slight snag in unmuting. Um, Sara, thank you so much for that very kind and generous intro. Um, thank you so much again for uh, your support of my chap and for being uh, a part of his journey. I'm really grateful for it. Um, also want to really deeply thank Malvika for inviting me to join um, this series that I very deeply love and um, I'm a big fan of and support very much. Also want to give a shout out to Topaz, my editor, who is in the audience. Uh, thank you so much for everything, <laughs> helping me stay on top of things. Um, and yeah, waiting for Frank Ocean and Cairo dropping next month. If you are in New York City, uh, stop by. And uh, if you're not, uh, try and get a copy online. Um Yes, yeah, so you're have... not doing a good job of this part. Um, I'm not. You're having a whole a whole launch party. I really am for your book, and the link is in the chat. It really is. It's it's in the chat. Yeah. Uh, okay. Can... Thank you so much. <laughs> so much for that. It is yes, correct. It is March March 18th. Um, yeah. So I have um some poems, uh, for y'all. I think I'm just going to go in alphabetical order. Yes. Um, the first one is, uh, it's called Austin Abyssidarian. 
because it's an absidarian. A um, little hard to convey it um, when it's being performed, but basically every line starts with um, a letter of the alphabet. <clears throat> <clears throat> the last time I saw you, you casually remarked, Austin adores its own amorphous quality. Unsolicited, my white roommate explains how he brews his own kombucha, the lead in being the jar of brown material in the fridge. He explains like I've never had the thing, like I've never lived in Connecticut where white women with bare feet lectured me on the morality of veganism mere minutes after explaining how the Knesset is actually quite the democratic institution. There are Arab parties, you know, the girl with the piercing said as she passed the joint around the room. Silently, I observe the world engulfed in flames from behind the treachery of stained glass. Here in the city of sewer alligators and flooded basements, I recall how silly the heat there was in October, my shirt practically see-through after a short walk to fetch affordable coffee, an increasingly rare commodity in a city where famous where a famous donut shop's motto was, keep Austin weird. The joke, of course, was that you could barely even keep the video store open in the city made famous by films and the people who made and saw them. Last night, you called me from your parents' house, unsure of how to break the news that you had finally decided to move back to where you'd swore to escape. And I pretended that I didn't wish I was still there, pretending that I actually needed to get up and walk with you to the bar to get the next round of cheap beer for the table of finite friends I have not talked to since. In different circumstances, I would apologize for having complained so much about the heat since. After all, it was in the heat that we walked till I felt like fainting, but I could not faint while you held my hand or leaned back into my arm so my chin could rest on your shoulder, knowing the cheap pitcher of beer was mere seconds away from being handed to us. There were foolish nights where I attempted to quench my unbelievable thirst with the cheap beer, but there was your foot under the table reminding me I had books to read and love to give, and I said thank you when really I wanted to say sorry. I did not kiss you under the rain when you asked me why I was so desperate to run away to New York. The next day, when you asked me to have ramen with you and only you, it was the first time I thought of never leaving Texas, despite how tired I'd grown of the city's ruse, its pointless dream of becoming some kind of vanguard of music and food when I did not spend a single day there in which an ad for a luxurious high rise I could never afford did not somehow find its way into my mailbox. My mistake was not having the camera ready when you came over in the teal dress. My joy was the bar table in which you refused to debate the xenophobe and opted instead to draw closer to my hunched body such that I could not bear to imagine a city in which I could not place my hand on your thigh as I asked you to leave with me, even though we both knew that our zealotry would not last the year. I forgot to say, uh, with the exception of the poem I'm about to read, uh, this is all like very new shit. Um, like none of it is published. Um, and most of them I haven't actually read at all before. So, uh, yeah, I'm very excited to be sharing them with you. Um, this one is, uh, well, I guess it's about to be published because this is going to be in the, uh, in the chat book uh, next month. Um, this was also straight to DVD. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to steal that term moving forward. Uh, but, yeah, <clears throat> this is uh, a series of, uh, from a series of centos in the chat book. Uh, and folks who don't know what Sento is basically a poem made up of lines um, from either other poems or other texts. Um, in this case, obviously, they're made from uh, Frank Ocean lyrics. Uh, so this one's called Don't Die. I should say, and you should hear, I've loved... I took a seat on the ice cold lawn. I took a walk with the palm trees as the daylight fell. Every moment was so precious then. I'm Richard Gere in a tux, roaming around like I'm ready for a funeral. I'm about to drive in the ocean. The entire earth is fighting. All the world is at its end. Spaceships are lifting off of a dying world. There will be tears. That's American law. There wasn't room for you and I, only you. Goodbye, goodbye, land of the free. We are all mortals, aren't we? Any moment this could go numb, 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 numb. Zero emotion, muted emotion, pitch corrected, computed emotion. I've no doubt this is the home of the brave. And millions are left behind while the sky burns. They don't mean too much. Cry, cry, cry. Even though that won't change a thing, I can't feel a thing. I can't be there with you talking to myself. 
And this next one is called Season of Dust. <clears throat> because Cairo was hot and dry, the cold became shorthand for civilization. The spell was not broken till years later when I slipped on a patch of ice at the intersection of cross and vine and thought my life would end right then and there outside the deli where I'd lied and said I was from Texas so I wouldn't have to have a conversation with a man who, went mel who meant well but asked too many questions. Because I'd spent years in the cold, I did not object to Texas even though I would make a habit of cursing the thickness of the air. The humidity became an easy excuse for my, for my unhappiness. The scapegoat for months of lying down on hardwood, contemplating the nature of dust. In California, the mountains seemed so close, graspable. Pampered by a reliable sun, I began to count winter as a thing of the past. I did not remove my blue parka from the depths of the closet. Several seasons and half a continent later, it was cold again, and you wrapped your hair, then asked me if I still found you beautiful. I wanted to hold your waist and let that be the highlight of my day. I wanted to be bothered by your mood, to change the meal at the last minute for whatever reason. In a dream, I beg you to make a mistake and say that you still love me. In the morning, I fry an excessive amount of turkey bacon, ignore conversations in the group chat. The discussion concerns axioms about taboos, the familiar rush of fear. I long so bad Badly to be terrified with you. I lied down in the street. I found one of your hairs on my desk. The smell of the bacon became overwhelming, but I never opened the window. <clears throat> this one's called The Faithful. A bad writer would have called me a prisoner. A better one would have focused on what mattered, the cruelty of desire, how exquisite that longing was, poetic even. Regarding my loss of faith, it was simple, really. God became a burden, an indifferent universe became favorable, favorable to a logical one, an infinite mystery to a singular one. Free of faith, I remained a sinner awaiting freedom, hopelessly awaiting retribution, the right hook when least expected, perhaps after the year's first snowfall. You were just buying a donut, and the next thing you know, you are lying on the ground, a tooth or two dislodged. I owe so much insight to my decaying gums. Three times in my life I have tasted blood and learned some kind of truth. We're all just trying to escape the, shun the sun's shadow and doing such a bad job. This next one is called The Futurist. <clears throat> On the most mundane of days, perhaps over a cup of mediocre grocery store coffee, I attempt to sit with the horror of reckoning with the inevitability of a sea of blue blood. When I say there is always a storm on the horizon, I am being literal. Every other day, my mother calls me in a panic about some new hurricane with a funny name and a penchant for destruction. In a moment of blissful foolishness, I wish for this country to do something to save itself from itself. I watch a movie about a sad man who goes to the moon and remember, everything would be replicated there too. What was done to the desert will be done to us. The frontier lives on in our streets, our bare hands, finger licking. On the brightest of mornings, I watch NYPD helicopters circle the sky, attempt to fathom the budget of nuclear warheads, the salaried men and women who keep them active and ready. Later that week, I am told to have faith because of a young politician's ball gown. As a distraction, I walk to the corroding corner store to buy a sandwich and remember that the grill is yet to be fixed. In a frenzy, I repeat myself, the earth will not die, we will die. The earth will not die, we will die. Ever twisted, your sense of humor remarks that it would actually be cool to go out like the dinosaurs. You claim to be unfazed by the possibility of our existence being nothing but a blip for the planet. Ever obsessed with an unreachable future, I ask, what will become of us then? And you simply respond, something, for the alien archaeologist to dick up and theorize. I imagine entire cities packed up and shipped off to an intergalactic museum. I imagine my name in a footnote before falling asleep. Um, I wanted to check in. Malvika, how much time do I have left? I didn't keep track, but I would say two more poems. Well, I literally have two more poems, so... Oh, perfect. This is perfect. That's what we need from you. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, this one is called The Yearner. <clears throat> On the arduous walk home, I remind myself rather forcefully that God gifts us the night, and for that I'm eternally grateful. 
Some days I wish I was small enough to die in the flame of a lantern. For now, I happily settle for a voice that croons an unbridled sense of yearning right into my tired ears. In their twilight years, both my grandfathers became near death. They'd stopped talking ages before. I'd grown used to awaiting crumbs of conversation. Hell is a flat tune you cannot dance to. I don't mind living in mediocrity if it means I live. I have never fancied myself Ali before the army, though I've prayed to never see through the eyes of Muhammad way of leading it. I've had fits of unshakable belief in the need to rid our lives of all machinery. I have regretted many a meal that cost over 50 pounds. I have found little comfort in virtual space. I attempted to collect discs and miserably failed. I bemoaned the product I could not wolf down. The camera was an agonizing device even in the right hands. I did not fear becoming a walking commercial. That was one inevitable thing I somehow made peace with. Back home, I grow tired of all the talk show hosts who would have you believe the fancy new prison being built is anything one could consider conscionable. I grow tired of them, and so I turn off the television at four in the morning. Later, at sundown, I break an unexpected fast with cold hibiscus tea and promise my mother I will make time to help her find a new coffee table. On the car ride into the unforgiving city, I remember the saint who gave the mountain Mu'attam its rather comical name. I hatch a plan to visit a beloved in Giza. I look forward to eating something warm that will leave me coming back for more. And this last one is called Winter. <clears throat> there was a day in which there was no end to your smile, such that I could have taken a picture of you every hour and your face would have remained static in a way that would now make me weep, like a crawling child stuck in a corner, unsure of how to turn around. When I could no longer take a photograph of you, it was the most normal experience of scorched earth I had ever known. A continent vaporized into clouds, a sun frozen in its tracks. And beneath it all, life continued. I was told to move on and buy champagne and touch lace and light a candle in the evening by which I might read a book or whisper something unconscionable. And in due time, I would do all of these things and more, but I could never bring myself to delete the one picture I did have of you from that day. Neither could I bring myself to look at it, lest my throat unraveled itself before me. So instead, I tucked it all the way in a folder I named one because I could not find a name for it. And I went to bed gritting my teeth and I woke up. You were still there. You were still not there. So I walked my, around my neighborhood, barely equipped for the cold until I could not feel your absence. Thank you guys so much. Holy shit, Hazem. Good God. Good God. Everyone give it up for Hazem Um Someday you should look back on the chat from this reading anytime you need to be gassed up and know like how profoundly you are loved by people who know you deeply and people who have just met you. Um, it was brilliant. I love that what was done to the desert was done to us. I really think like now we're all going to drop our hairs on your desk um, and hope that you'll write about us in the same way. Uh, okay, finally, now it's my pleasure uh, to introduce the wonderful, wonderful Eleanor Vile, um, who we've all been introduced to and now we will be reintroduced to. So French-American vocalist and multi-instrumentalist and overall dream girl, Eleanor creates and performs soulful interpretations of klezmer, Yiddish, and French and Occitan music. Um, one moment, okay. Uh, yeah, klezmer, Yiddish, French, Occitan, everything. She also uh, does original compositions, poems, and improvisations. She plays with her um, socially conscious Yiddish music ensemble, Sibele, and travels the world and plays a thousand instruments, some of, some of which have not even been invented yet, but some among them are the wooden flute, piano, accordion, hurdy-gurdy, and uh, she's also a lead singer. I met Eleanor just this past October through my wonderful friend Noah, who is in the Zoom room currently. Uh, my friend, what wonderful friend Noah, what you need to know about him is that he's crazy. Uh, he's magical, but he's crazy. And because he is crazy, he's always surrounded by the most wonderful women in the world. Uh, and the evening I met Eleanor, I had this feeling within me that was like, like a compass I carried in my heart cracked because I reached my destination. I was like, oh, now I have met the most beautiful and sensual woman in the world. Now I can finally like learn so many things about myself and about womanhood and about poetry and love and about the world at last. 
finally I've arrived and now I can die happily. Um, and you'll see in a moment why. Um, I'm just going to keep going a little bit. It's all right. So that evening I met her, she told me this story about how her father is a musician, the same way she is a musician. And he would take her as a very small child uh, with him on the road and on his shows. And when he performed and when he was not performing, um, she would take these little naps in his bass drum. She would curl up in the drum and take a nap. And then she would sit there and she would shadow puppet her hands. Um, and then recently in like a moment of, um, in a moment of like confusion and loss, I like wrote a poem in her voice uh, addressing myself uh, to tell myself like everything I needed to hear. Um, and if it's all right with everyone, I'd like love to read a little piece of it and just like embarrass the hell out of her. Does that feel all right? And it's a little self-emotional. Um, okay. But this is also it's a direct to DVD. It's not been anywhere. Um, so this is the poem in the voice of Eleanor Lyle. Um, and she, she did not say any of this. She said, in a dream, she came to me one night and said, I was raised in a family of musicians. My father would always take me with him wherever he went on the road to his shows. When he played, I would curl up outside of the drum. When he stopped playing, I would curl up inside of the drum and there I would shadow puppet my hands. Are you all right? Are you comfortable here? Would you like something wonderful to eat? See, I have made this jar of pickles. It is enormous, but matches how much I knew I would love you. It matches my anticipation of our hunger together. See, watch me unclasp my earrings with one hand like I'm cracking an egg. Watch me open this jar by touching my knee to my nose. In a season of great transformation, I learned this art, you see. I asked God to make a beautiful new world for it to catch me like a net. Then I made the brine for the pickles from my tears. See, taste, each pickled thing is a prayer. When I saw how well this worked, I began cooking other things the way God had whispered to me in dreams. I do not know if it is really God, only that she comes to me and I hear her voice in my ear and I know, I know in my heart that if I were to open my eyes, I would see my very own self. So I began, I began drinking water that comes only from a well upstate where my cousin lives. I began eating bread made from yeast I bloom in my mother's garden. I began eating salt I scraped off the floor of the salt flat with a nickel into a jam jar. And there are, of course, complications. After its life as a jam jar, before its life as a salt jar, like all of us, it was a home for cardamom coffee. I brewed for myself on the highway. The salt will always taste of cardamom brewed on the highway. On the last day in a beloved home, always taste of sunset the highway and you are late for dinner. The gesture of care between two people connected by the red thread of time. The woman I was in the city in the morning. The woman I would become by night. I can say this to you because you understand what it is to always be driving on the highway towards annihilation of the ego, to go into the night, into the dark of the forest and wait patiently for the transformation of self. The truth is, as everyone told me, it does not take very long. Once you find a seat in your own heart, the changes come pouring in like a tambourine. I see with my heart that your heart is very clean. I know because I have in my possession a very special stethoscope. I learned the signs from the woman in Baltimore who I study Feldenkrais with. What is that? What is Feldenkrais? The easiest way for me is for us to just do it together. Let us be very, very, very easy. Let us remember all, all that we have forgotten. Just like this poem, I knew it would come pouring out of you as soon as the power went out. There, see, your resistance, it melted away in a heartbeat. Not because we tamed it, because we distracted its wildness with a dance of light. I was not always the most beautiful woman on the planet, you know. I began, became so by taking out my knives, by polishing them with love and rage and applying them to the world. I became so by letting my resistance melt away and leave behind only spirit, child, and the body. Now I am the curliest woman in the universe. The first juniper blossom got its scent from me. Now we've talked enough. Recite to me any poems you know by heart. And I just remembered, don't you have a spinach pie in your bag that you were saving for just the three of us? And see, I have already turned on the oven. Okay. So this is my deep fantasy and projection of Eleanor. And now, now uh, hopefully she's been made to blush. And um, Eleanor Weil, take it away. You should be able to turn on your <laughs> microphone. I'm so sorry. 
<laughs> and I love you so much. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. Oh my God, I'm laughing. Wow. Wow. That's... <laughs> You're amazing. Thank you so much. And wow, this is so um, uh, so moving and uh, touching. And um, with all the other speaker and wonderful poets before, I'm just like, Whoo, wow, uh, all uh, feeling like many constellations uh, and planets turning all outside and inside and. So I'm going to try to gravitate around it and share a few poems. But thank you so, so much. And it's been a, such a dream to meet you. Thank you, Noah, for um, making the connection. And, and um, I hope it's a long road and to hear more of everyone's uh, poetry also. Wow. <sighs> wow. <laughs> So I'm not from the poets, uh, poetry world like so much, and wow, I, I, it's so touching, and I, I'm gonna stop talking because I'm not so good at that, and I'm just gonna play and sing a, a little bit, um, uh, and I might have to like if there is huge sounds coming out, I might have to go for a minute downstairs with my roommate saying. Uh, to wait a few more minutes for their drum punk rehearsal with, uh, so I might have to do that. <laughs> um, all right, so a first poem I wanted to share is by, um, so I, I put into music for now. Um, actually, you, you take it, you, I didn't know you were do, gonna do that, so I was like gonna do a piece uh, in music of that, that like little pieces, but I think uh, in April, like, uh, yeah, so I will do it. <laughs> I love it. It's much like it's, yeah. It, that would be so nice. Yeah, but let's do it for April. And like, that is great. Okay. Like that, uh, yeah, like that I can honor other people, women. And uh, yeah, so the first one will be um, by Celia Dobkin. It's called, uh, it's from the book, uh, the, the Acrobat. She's this very... Uh, uh, beautiful, sensual um, uh, uh, Yiddish poets from the 20th century. And it's the continuation of the first song I played. My hands, the one leaves I'm not uh, ashamed of. Is the sound okay? I'm not ashamed of my fingers like a coral branch fingers like the two nests of white snake or maybe the memory of a sex lover Ich schäme mich nicht. 
thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, um, the other one honors uh, nature uh, on a tree. There's um, uh, it's an esoteric poem, esoteric poem by Aaron Zeitlin. That um, it's a long, long poem, uh, also in Yiddish. On a tree stand the sun. On the sun stand uh, no sorry on a hill stand a, uh, a tree on a tree stand the sun and around it is greenness and the whiteness is open and there's a person coming by in a carriage and the wind flush and the tree becomes a bird and the bird becomes a nest and the nest is the entire world and the entire world stand in the tree and is in this empty carriage so it's just the beginning of, of this um, poem. <laughs> Sorry, I'm gonna do that again. Thanks for bearing with me. I'm it's next. brilliant and we're obsessed. <laughs> wow, I'm so okay. I'm gonna start with the word is confusing this day. I'm very confused. <laughs> time so like um, do I have time for one more or this is I don't want to let me know I don't know one let's or do two. one more one more thank you um well you did really made me <laughs> so blush um I just want to also say uh I came to Yiddish um also as a a way to express uh, my half Jewish <laughs> root, my mother Ashkenazi side uh, from Poland, not relating to anything with the nationalist, uh, um, militarist uh, Israeli uh, government, and uh, as a way to express Jewishness with no like um, 
uh, yeah, also being an anti-Zionist and uh, um, with my band Sibele, like trying to support uh, the the uh, another way to be uh, Jews and in in uh, in exile in Golis, but in uh, um, in solidarity of what's happening in Palestine right now and. Um, uh, collaborating with uh, Bayan, who is a Palestinian Jordanian, and uh, that thank you so much, Malvika, for being able like that. We can do uh, things together next time in April. I'm looking forward to that. So it's like a, a little conversation with Yiddish and Arabic. Um, yes. So last one about um, there's some English words like that. I will. Uh, by uh, Dora Tetelbaum, and uh, yeah, it's English, so I don't need to.
Thank you so much. Thank you. I want to give it up for Eleanor Vile. Um, so, so, so brilliant. Absolutely a dream. Oh my goodness. Um, thank you so much. And thank you, Adiba. Thank you, Haloon. Thank you, Abby. Sara, dear Hazem, um, Eleanor, thank you for that performance. And thank you to everyone in the room. Um, oh, I love all these kisses. Hi, friends at Belladonna. Oh my God. Um, I'm in agreement with what Sana said in the chat. This reading should have been titled Poets with the Most Beautiful Voices in the Whole World. Um, and what Topaz said also that she wants to record this reading to fall asleep to. Uh, there's so many, so many beautiful lines that I, I now feel like reciting out to all of you, but I know we've been on the Zoom a bit long. Um, I want to pass the mic now to the beautiful and wonderful Topaz Winters, who has a little invitation that they're going to give you. Um, and Topaz, take it away. Uh, my name is Topaz. Thank you so much for this stunning reading. Um, I think someone said in the chat that they feel like a new person. I very much echo that. Um, I just wanted to come in with a super quick note that uh, Hasm Fami's new chapbook, Waiting for Frank Ocean in Cairo, comes out March 18th, and we have a little party happening um, at Nook uh, in Brooklyn um, on March 18th at 8 p.m. It's free. It's open to the public. Um, we would love to see all of your beautiful faces there. Um, this is the first in-person reading that our press has done um, since the pandemic. Um, so this is going to be a really special night. We have some incredible guest readers. Um, and uh, of course, Hazem will be there also reading his work. Um, and if you can't make it, uh, please uh, think about pre-ordering the book. Uh, we're super excited for it. Um, it's just going to be, um, it's just such a stunning collection. It's going to be a wonderful night. Um, and we'd love to see you all there. Thank you so much, Topaz. Um, order the book. I dropped the links. Go to this party. It's a real, real in-person party. Um, and thank you all so much. This was so beautiful. I feel so blessed to be in this Zoom with so many brilliant people. Um, just there's so much. There's so much that happens here. Um, I love so many lines that were said. It's your I love when poems double as snitching. Just thank you to all of you for being here, for convening with us uh, in the Liberational Party. I don't know who it is who said the thing about like it not being a real political party unless there's cupcakes, but I'm hoping that when we resume in-person readings uh, next month that we'll be here uh, sort of like lavishing with like the delights of the world. Um.